as Pastor Jerry comes up to uh, kick us off for worship this morning. I think he has a birthday coming up. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor Jerry. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I remind my family I can still do everything I did when I was 20. And they say, that just shows you how pathetic you were at 20. <laughs> Our call to worship this morning is found in Revelation. We used it last week. We're going to use it again. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Let's say it together. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. We're rejoicing this morning with all the angels, the glory of our Lord and Savior. Let's stand and worship.
power are His. All glory forever, amen. Jesus, He lives. All honor and power are His. All glory forever, amen. Jesus lives. Jesus lives. He is risen. He is risen. He is alive. Go to 
wanna hear my praises roar from the ashes. Hope will arise and death is defeated. The King is alive. We worship you, Jesus. We praise you. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Jesus is still enough Be me within your love I will sing your praise again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail. Promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me yet. I see you do it again. 
I see you do it again. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me. Just a congregation. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet. And I never will forget. If you'd like to come up front here to the altar and pray. The time is now open. You're the resurrection that we've waited for. You buried the night and, and came with the morning You're the King of Heaven, all praise is yours The longer the quiet, the louder the chorus oh, oh.
Dark spring As we continue with worship this morning, um, let's take a moment for, for prayer. If you'd, if you'd like to give to any of the ministries of the church, you may do so online or offering boxes. And we thank you so much for giving, uh, for everything that we do in all the ministries that, that happen here. But let's pray together. Father God, we are so grateful, Lord, with how you bless us. Lord, how you give to us. Lord, beautiful family, Lord, this wonderful church. And the people around us, Father. And Lord, I pray for all the gifts that are given and all the ministries that are done, Lord, in this time that we spend together either this morning. It's all about you. Father, bless each one who is here together in this service or even watching us online today or tomorrow or a year from now. Lord, that you would speak to each of our hearts. Lord, we love you so much. We pray for Pastor Jerry and the message that he is bringing this morning, Lord. And we ask that you would just speak to our hearts. Give us exactly what we need. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Um, I, I mentioned first service. We have kind of an all-star team up here. Uh, Emma, of course, plays in our youth worship, and Jason is, plays on the worship team here in this service. Anna Snyder, who is our sports director, uh, does sign language. And then Tawny Fuller, who um, has been doing a mime ministry, which started as a prison ministry, and she's been working with our kids even here uh, doing this ministry. They've all kind of come together uh, to do this song for us this morning.
joked last service that Jerry's a year older, so I better get the pulpit over here for him. It's still funny this service. Someday. <laughs> paybacks are terrible. It is great to be with you this morning to study God's Word. We're going to be in the book of Revelation. Let us uh, read out of Revelation, the 21st chapter verses 1 through 8, I believe. I'm changing it up a little bit for him. Revelation 21, 1 through 8. Would you please stand? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this. And I will be their God and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. May God add the blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. We're going to be in a series of messages beginning today. Uh, we're going to be bookending the sermon with two sermons or so with what is heaven. We're going to be talking about kingdom thinking. And we need to think about heaven and what God has prepared for us. And then we're going to spend some time talking about what it means to be living in the kingdom of God. How Christ anticipates or intends for us rather to live in his kingdom as kingdom children now. And then at the end of that series, I plan to have a couple messages or a message on hell. So as believers, we have so much to anticipate. Let's pray. Father, open our hearts to your truth this morning. Help us to understand what awaits us. Help us to understand that we are not to have our eyes fixed on this world, but our eyes fixed on you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to speak to each of our hearts. For those who are watching online and those who are here in person, we pray, Father, that this would be a great time of 
hearing your truth and celebrating what you are already preparing for us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. The beautiful city. Have you ever heard the phrase, they are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good? Anybody ever heard that phrase? Am I, am I the only one that's ever heard that? No. Yeah. The implication of that phrase or statement is that we are so caught up in the future eternal blessings, our heads are kind of in the clouds, that we are not connecting to the lost world around us. There's a lot of brokenness around us. A lot of people who are struggling. Well, that could have been said about many a long time ago. But as things go, we tragically redefine that statement by our actions so that Christians oftentimes are so earthly-minded, earthbound, that they have no eternal vision, no sense of the spiritual need around us. Sometimes we get so earthbound that we have our eyes on our beautiful homes, our investment portfolios, we're planning our retirements with Epicurean delight. We eat, drink, and be merry because we think, hey, life's short. Let's have dessert early. And I must confess that sometimes in the pursuit of ministry, preaching, teaching, outreach, that at times I've lost sight of the eternal that great city of God that awaits us. Sometimes in the hustle and bustle, I forget that I am already a participant in the great kingdom of God right now. In Randy Elkhorn's book, Heaven, he shares insights about Jonathan Edwards. You may remember Jonathan Edwards was the great Puritan preacher. And often... He spoke of heaven. He said, It becomes us to spend this life only as a journey toward heaven, to which we should subordinate all other concerns of life. Why should we labor for or set our hearts on anything else, anything else but that which is our proper end and our true happiness? John 5, 24 says it this way. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Let me, let me say that again. We have crossed over from death to life. The word crossed over is in the perfect tense and indicates an accomplished Transition and a settled state. I refer to this and continue to refer to it, will continue to refer to it in the future, that it's a done deal. My eternal existence is already begun. It won't begin when this old heart stops beating. It began the moment I said yes to Jesus Christ. It's a done deal. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 18 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I've had a pretty busy few days. My daughter is home from Florida, and we've been traveling some, and then I went to Mount Gilead this weekend, yesterday, or Friday night and Saturday, and had to go to Willard, Ohio, which is an hour beyond that, to a funeral. It was the funeral of my uncle who had died in 2021 of COVID. But uh, he was uh, tree tall in my eyes. I remember him as a man early in his life who was not a Christian, but became a Christian. And he became my friend, not just my uncle. See, a lot of my uncles and I are fairly close in age, you know. We're not that much distance. I have better relationships with them than I have many of my cousins who are a lot younger than I am. But this uncle uh, became a saved man. 
And we attended conferences together. We went to men's retreats together. We went to prayer breakfasts together. He helped me with planning the church in Columbus. He was just a godly man. And I was at his funeral and gave testimony about his life, just a little thing that happened in our lives. But another man in the church got up and said, I thank you for my Uncle Larry. He said, said to the church, he said, we played golf a lot. But he said, it seemed like every time we were out playing golf or eating lunch or something, he just had to share with somebody about Jesus. I thought, whoa, that's good stuff. You see, he had passed from death to life. He was a new creature. The old had gone, the new had come. So because we have transitioned from death to life, and have received our great salvation through Christ, and our new creations, our new creatures in Christ, we need to start living as children of God's great kingdom, understanding what that kingdom means. So today I want to remind you, in reference to heaven, the why of this sermon, in reference to heaven, what God has planned for us, now in Jesus, Jesus is now preparing that place for us. Because when we grasp what God is preparing and what we can anticipate in our lives, when we grasp that, we are going to want to share that good news with everybody. We're going to want to take as many people with us as we can. Let's fill the car up, the bus up. Let's get as many as we can go. <laughs> John 14, 1 through 3 says it this way. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Any of you ever get a troubled heart? All the uncertainties of life, the problems, the struggles. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Jesus is saying, take your vision off of the troubles and put it on me. Trust in me also. In my Father's, listen to this, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Well, let me read that last phrase again. Let's do a little better on the amen part. I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. <laughs> Let's give the Lord a round of applause. I mean, he loves you. He wants you with him. He never meant for you to live here infinitum without him. He wants you to be with him. And he's made a way where there seems to be no way. Great Redeemer. So everything will be made brand new, number one. A new heaven and a new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first earth, first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. The new creation is described as a new heaven and a new earth. That is a totally new heaven and a new earth. In other words, he's just not going to come in here, take the world and straighten it around a little bit. It's a total rebuild <laughs> and it's supported by additional statement that says for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away you know sometimes as I drive around this valley and I've said this before after being here 34 years I got nothing new but as I drive around this valley and I am out on the road a lot I think what did this place look like it is so beautiful what did it look like before we messed it all up where we started parking cars in the creeks and you know leaving stuff laying all over and garbage and all that what did this place look like pristine well God's going to make it all new and there's something nice about new my daughter's probably watching this in Cleveland today and she was here so we went car shopping she, her car's getting old we started looking for a different car Never stick your head in a new car. You smell that new smell. Her old car don't smell like that. 
That new smell is pretty intoxicating. <laughs> you know? It lures you in. You could make a million, million, millions of dollars if you could reproduce that smell and spread in your car. They probably got it already. I don't know. But anyway, there's something wonderful about new. Human history begins in a garden. And for the believers, its finality is in the city of God. His garden paradise. In John's apostle, in John the Apostle's day, Rome was admired. It was seen as a great city, yet God saw it as an abomination. That which is highly esteemed among men is deplorable in the sight of God. That which we think is so beautiful here has nothing can even begin to compare with what God has in store. Luke 16, 15 says, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. The eternal city of God is then compared as a bride beautifully adorned. You see, when we begin reading about the city of God, and our eternal destiny. It talks about this bride. Well, we are the bride. And you, when you think of the city, any city, it's just not bricks and mortar, it's people. We are the people of God. We who have believed in him and made him our Lord and Savior, we are the children of God. We are the bride of Christ. And he's preparing for us beautifully. God's statement in Revelation 21, 5 through 6 says, He who is seated on the throne says, I am making everything new. How important is that statement of his recreative and creative ability? The realization that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners. Yet the same God who is going to create a new heaven and earth creates in us a clean heart, a new heart, a new life, a new way. We are not stuck here forever without hope. In spite of our failures and the mess we've made of our lives, he can give you a clean heart, a new start, just like he did for my uncle, just like he did for me, just like he did for my grandfather, just like he did for my father, just like he did for Abraham, who he called out of an idolatrous people. In spite of our failures and the messes we've made, and by the way, there's something wonderful about the Lord because he, you know, I, are you like me? I'm, as I get older, I think, boy, I wish I could hit the reset button and redo a few things. Unfortunately, I don't have that ability. But I have a God who is able to restore the lost years. The brokenness of my heart, he can heal. The failures of this body, he can restore. Second Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. God is going to make everything new. He goes on to say, There will be a new Jerusalem. I saw the holy city. He calls it the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. The new Jerusalem will reflect the glory of God. It will represent his perfected forevermore. Let's face it. The old Jerusalem created by human hands. If you go to Jerusalem today, and I appreciated you sending me there several years ago. It gave me a whole different perspective on Jerusalem. But if you go there today, the sites you want to see, many of them are what we call subterranean. They're below ground level. Why? Because Jerusalem would be built and then destroyed and rebuilt and destroyed and rebuilt and restored. And so if you want to get down to where things really happened in Jesus' day, you got to go down several layers. Well, just think about it. I've lived in the High Valley for 34 years here. And do you realize how much this valley has changed in 34 years? The things I've seen come and go? You know, for instance, 
that wonderful place called Walmart. Used to be a hole in the ground. <coughs> Junk ground. And now it's our happy place. I'm just teasing. Don't write me a letter. No. It was made with human hands. The Jerusalem is an incredible historic place, but the Jerusalem we must anticipate will be completely different. It won't be crowded or limited by man's vision. It will not be scarred by many wars and conquerors. It'll be made new. No, it'll be the new Jerusalem, the one the patriarchs of Scripture look forward to. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 11.10 about Abraham. By faith, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he, listen to this, was looking forward to a city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He was not earthbound, but had a heavenly vision, didn't he? Revelation 3.12 says, Him who overcomes I will make like a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And the same creative power that makes that can create in you a clean heart, a new heart, a new life, a new vision, a restored life. But secondly, God will dwell with us. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. God will live with us. The word here, dwell, is the verb form of the noun translated tabernacle. You may remember that God tabernacled with them as they made their journey through the wilderness. They even had the feast of the tabernacle. The presence of God in scripturally, Scripture frequently connotes fellowship and blessing as God abides with them. Now, this is just not an appearance of God at the holy city, but God will live with us. We will be his people and he will be our God. You know, in this life, all of our lives, we've tried to elect officials who would represent our kingdom thinking, so to speak. And tragically, we have been disappointed over the years by their failures. But now, in Christ, in God's kingdom, we will be secure. We won't live with disappointment and failures. We will be secure in Almighty God on the throne with the Son in control of everything. And that will mean freedom from apprehension and fear and distrust. We will be bathed in His beauty and the power uh, we will live in passes all understanding. And the love of God will envelop us in its perfection. The book of Leviticus talks about that because he talks about the barrier between God and mankind being removed. You see, man in the garden, Eve in the garden, the first couple sinned, and as a result, sin took hold in our own lives. We have a carnal nature. We have a sin nature because we are related to them. But praise God, there's a new Adam. <laughs> praise God, there's a Jesus who defeated all that. But there was a barrier, and listen to what it says in Leviticus 26, 11 through, through 13, as we anticipate his great kingdom. He says, I will put my dwelling place among you. I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke, enabled you to walk with heads held high. I was once a sinner, a broken man, enslaved to many things. But Christ has broken those barriers. He's given me a new life. And I can hold my head high, not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done. Isn't that good news? You rejoice. You're not the same person you were before you came to Christ. Well, you ought not be anyway. Ezekiel says it this way in the 37th chapter. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers. I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Then the nations will know that I, the Lord, make Israel holy when my sanctuary is among them forever. This, thus the new Jerusalem is not just man's future dwelling, but it is our eternal home with God. God's presence will blot out all the struggles of our formal, former life. We got a new beginning coming. Romans 8, 18 says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. 2 Corinthians says, 4.17-18, for, for For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So what do we do? We fix, our eyes on not, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. What is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So there's going to be a new order. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. God will dwell with us. But thirdly, the old order will pass away. Revelation 21, 3 through 4 says, They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Listen to this. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning, crying, for the old order of things has passed away. There are struggles here on this earth. We know that. Things go wrong, things happen to us. Challenge our very existence. In Revelation 7, 14 through 17, it says, These are they who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, because you've got white robes that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. He who sits on the throne will spread His tent over them. Never again will they go hungry. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them or any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. See, he's referring to a great tribulation in the last days. But let's face it, Christians have been in tribulation since the days that Jesus came out of the grave and even before. We need to understand that Christians have always been persecuted and will remain so till the final judgment. And it will intensify in the last days. Daniel 12, 1 says, At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people will arise. There'll be time of distress such as not a happen from the beginning of the nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. That's one time you want to have your name in the book, on the ledger. Jesus speaks, on the, speaks of it in Matthew For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would have survived. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. When we think about those who have come out of the tribulation, they have been washed in the blood of Christ, white robes. 
They have a purpose. They are serving. He is protecting them. He is shepherding them. So in the presence of God, we have a picture of great comfort for the redeemed and particularly for those who have been martyred and come through the times of tribulation. And what does it say he'll do? He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. You see, those who come out of the tribulation have had tears. Those who face the judgment of God have tears. But there's coming a time when he's going to wipe those tears away. Psalms 126 has a picture of God's heart for the faithful. In Psalms 126, 5 through 6, it says, Those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. He who goes out weeping, carrying the seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with him. In other words, bring in the harvest. We're going to celebrate. Now, I want you to note the personal touch. This is so different from what the world says. Sometimes when I fall down or do something stupid, my daughter says to me, suck it up, buttercup. See, that's the world says those kind of things to us, you know. But Scripture tells us that in those last moments, Jesus is going to wipe the tears from our eyes. That's personal touch. That's him taking the initiative. It's the opposite of the way that Satan portrays God. He portrays him as harsh and uncaring and aloof. But here we see him wiping the tears from their cheeks. How many of us have seen a little child stub their toe or get scared and there's great big what we call alligator tears on their cheeks and you wipe them off and usually it involves a good hug and a little kiss on the cheek it says everything's going to be all right that's my god but it also goes on to say there's no more death or pain i love that part you know, I realize, as Pastor Matt pointed out so abruptly, that I have a shelf life that is waning. <laughs> but I was on a vacation, and Rob and I wanted to do an activity, and she read the fine print on it. It said, no one over 65 can do this. I thought, really? I was interested in a new ministry, and so I looked it up on the internet, and it said you could not be over 40 to do this. <laughs> I thought, do I look dead to you people? Some of you know that on vacation... My vacation, Rob and I went on a little cruise to celebrate her retirement. And one day I was walking in a bunch of people on a wet floor by the pool, and I slipped and fell down, and I hit hard. I went, bang, like that. I was a little embarrassed, you know, still collecting my thoughts, and I look up, there's this big strapping young teenager who says, Sir, are you okay? Can I help you up? And I felt like I was in that commercial, help, I've fallen and I can't get up, you know? <laughs> and this kid's standing over me, looking at me, and he says, can I help you up? And all at once I realized, I look like a senior citizen. <laughs> and I'm hurting, and I don't want him to know I'm hurting. You know, it's like one of our staff members said, you know, when you fall down as a young person, young guy, your friends all point at you and laugh. But when you fall down as a senior citizen, they call an ambulance immediately. <laughs> I was laying on the ground. He said, sir, can I help you up? Are you okay? And I jumped up to my feet, and I was like W.C. Fields. I wanted to say, get away from me, kid. You bother me. Some of you don't even know who that is. But anyway, but I was hurting for a moment. In the kingdom of God, there's no more crying or pain. 
when I get up in the mornings and my back hurts and my knees hurt I realize I'm going to a better place in the kingdom of God there's no more death or crying or pain 1 Corinthians 15 53 through 55 says for the perishable that's us must close ourselves in the imperishable the eternal that is and the mortal with immortality you got to clothe yourself with it you got to make a decision whether you want to live forever in his great kingdom you got to make a decision do you want to live on in the pain and anger and anguish of this world with no hope or do you want to live in the hope of Christ Jesus he says, when the perishable has clothed itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Oh, let's say it together. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, oh, death is your victory? Where, oh, death is your sting? In the closing note, the city of God is described as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. We are that bride. In Revelation 21, 6 through 7, it says, He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. And he who overcomes will inherit all this. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. We have an eternal home for all who would be who would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you may be here today saying, man, that sounds wonderful. The important thing is, have you given your heart to Christ? You who are believers need to rejoice and get busy about getting as many as we can into the kingdom. We need to just be witnessing and sharing and talking and encouraging others but if you're here today and you have a question you have an uncertainty you have a hope so mentality I want to tell you you can know that you know that you know that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and you can have that eternal hope but you choose I cannot choose for you we have an eternal home for all who have believed on Jesus today could be your day to believe confess and trust him for eternity Let's stand. Father God, as we conclude this time together, I pray that you will help us for those who are weighed down, those who have the world pressing on, help them understand that they cannot be earthbound, but they need to understand there is a kingdom. We are part of that kingdom now. We are children of the king. For those who are standing here who are saying, hey, I don't know if my name is in that book. Today could be the greatest day of their life as they receive you as their personal Savior. As they ask you to be their God and their eternal King. As they ask you to forgive them of their sins. As they ask you to give you them your eternal life. Lord, let them make that decision for you today and not waste any more of this life on a hope so mentality. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will sing a new song Cause death is dead and gone with the winter We will sing a new song Let hallelujahs flow like a river We're coming back to life Reaching towards the light your love is like springtime. I want to close this service with this. Second Peter, the third chapter. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming.
The day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteous dwell. Father God, as we leave this place today, help us to be determined to be in your kingdom, to accept you, to seek your forgiveness, to place our faith and trust in you solely, and to become people after your own heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.